Hello and welcome. In this clip we will have a look at 120 special quaternions. They will form vertices of a 4-dimensional regular solid that is surrounded by 600 tetrahedra and it is usually referred to as the 600 cell. For me it is very fascinating that just from adding and multiplying certain numbers with certain rules you can end up with intricate geometrical structures that exceed all human intuition. I hope that I can share some of my fascination with you. There will be a short introduction for everyone that is not familiar with quaternions. In short, each quaternion is a collection of four numbers and there are special rules how to add and multiply them. Let's step back and show the key idea of this presentation in the framework of complex numbers. Here we will have a look at a special complex number denoted with Q. To multiply Q with itself, one has to perform well-known steps of algebra. One half times one half is one fourth. The last term in each factor multiplies to three over four times i squared. And two times one half times root three over two times i evaluates to root three over two times i. The only strange fact about complex numbers is the deal that i squared is equal to minus one. Therefore, the first two terms combine to minus one half. This calculation is now repeated a few times to determine all the powers of Q. Surprisingly, after six multiplications, we simply get one, and the process starts over again. When plotted, the six numbers form a regular hexagon. The experts won't be surprised, of course, since we've started with the sixth root of unity. Therefore, there is a deeper reason for this result. We could have similarly started with a third, fourth, fifth or any other root of unity to end up with triangles, squares, pentagons or any regular polygon we would have wished for. It also shows the tight relationship between multiplication of complex numbers and two-dimensional rotations. This idea is now extended to quaternions. The calculations become quite tedious, therefore a computer algebra program should be used. The rules for calculations with quaternions are for instance easily loaded into Mathematica. Instead of one complex number, we will focus on two quaternions denoted with omega and q. For completeness, the multiplication of quaternions is demonstrated for the product omega times omega. The first step is straightforward again. The two sums are multiplied piece by piece. For every part of the first factor, there will be four parts in the final product. The corresponding pieces are color-coded. Now the special properties of quaternion multiplication have to be applied. First, all imaginary units i, j and k square to negative 1. This generalizes smoothly from the complex numbers. It gets more peculiar, however. When the order of two different imaginary units is interchanged, there is an additional minus sign to account for this change. If you are worried about this, that'll be okay. But it is a fact that the only consistent way to define multiplication and division for quaternions implies the non-commutativity of the imaginary units. This strange property further simplifies the term for omega square. Finally, the real and imaginary pieces are collected to end up with the result that is confirmed by the computer algebra. What happens when omega and q are multiplied with each other in random sequences? To find out, the quaternions are denoted more compactly. Only the coefficients are collected in components and shortcuts for the expressions containing the root of 5 are introduced. An auxiliary function is used to find all possible products. In this module, one starts with omega and q as new elements. Each of them is multiplied from the right with either of the generators omega and q to form four new elements. There is one more list called all elements where all generated quaternions are stored. These four quaternions are now treated as newly generated elements and they are also added to the list of all elements. Then the process is repeated with these four new elements. In the next step there will be eight elements generated from these four quaternions. However, only seven out of the eight new elements are different. The seventh product has already been added to the list of all elements and therefore it can be disregarded. 
Therefore, the list of new elements will not grow forever. It turns out that there are 120 quaternions that can be generated from the two quaternions omega and q. The construction process can also be visualized by a tree that is shown here. Each new branch corresponds to a multiplication with omega or q. Each level of the tree corresponds to the newly generated quaternions. In the first level there are two nodes, in the second there are four, then seven and so on. Now let's turn these 120 quaternions into geometry. We simply forget about their imaginary units and treat each quaternion as a four-dimensional vector pointing towards a position in a four-dimensional space. The scalar product of two vectors comes as a useful tool. When the length of each vector is calculated, it turns out that they all have the same unit length. All points are therefore located on a hypersphere in a four-dimensional space. On this sphere, some pairs of points are closer to each other than other pairs. It is easy to measure the distance between all these points and the largest and the shortest distance between any two points can be determined. The largest distance of course corresponds to antipodal points that have a distance of two. All pairs of points with the shortest distance are now connected by edges and the edges are collected in a list. To find them, simply all possible pairs of points are tested and it turns out that there are 720 of these shortest lines. Moreover, from the sample of the first edges, one can conclude that each point is connected to 12 nearest neighbors, which confirms the total number of 12 times 120 over two edges. Next it is investigated which of these edges form triangles. In order to do so, edges have to have common points. In the first example, all three edges have the point 1 in common. However, this is not sufficient to form a triangle. In this case, the three lines all meet in one point. In the second example, any two pairs of edges have a point in common and in total there are three different common points. These are the conditions for a triangle. The computer scans through all triplets of edges and finds all of them that fulfill these properties. It takes a few minutes to check all combinations, but in the end there is a list of 1200 triangles. The sample shows that each edge is contained in five different triangles. That confirms the number of 1200 triangles as a product of 720 times 5 over 3. It is not efficiently possible to scan through all arrangements of four triangles to find the combinations that form tetrahedra. Instead, first all pairs of triangles that share a common edge are determined. There are 7200 of them. To form tetrahedra, only pairs with four different triangles are good candidates. On top, these four different triangles have to have exactly six different edges. When these two constraints are imposed, there will be 1800 tetrahedra formed from these 7200 pairs. A short inspection shows that always three of the tetrahedra are equal because there are three different possibilities to build a single tetrahedron from two pairs of triangles. Once the equal tetrahedra are removed from the list, we end up with 600 tetrahedra and each triangle is part of two tetrahedra. The four-dimensional Euler number analog is zero, which shows that the object has the same topology as a hypersphere, which is no big surprise, of course. By now, everyone should be convinced that this set of 120 points is more than just a collection of points. Now comes the hardest part. Let's try to make the geometry visible. In a first attempt, the last coordinate of each vector is simply omitted and the corresponding points are plotted into a three-dimensional coordinate system. The points show some regular patterns. When the edges are added, it looks nice too. The outer triangles form a nice triangulation of the surface of a sphere. When a little bit of transmission is added, the inside reveals a complete mess. Therefore, more sophisticated tools have to be used. In the first tool, the 4-dimensional 600 cell is unfolded into a 3-dimensional network of tetrahedra. In the 3-dimensional analog, the icosahedron can be unfolded into a 2-dimensional network of 20 triangles. The color indicates how far the triangle originally was tilted into the third dimension. Similarly, the 600 cell is shown in its unfolded state. 
The 600 tetrahedra can be unfolded by rotations around the common faces. Rotations in four dimensions do not only fix an axis of rotation, they fix a two-dimensional plane. The unfolding allows to display the result inside a three-dimensional space as a three-dimensional arrangement of tetrahedra. The red color again indicates the tilt into the fourth dimension in the full four-dimensional picture. I guess in a four-dimensional school, diligent students would have to cut this structure and form it into a four-dimensional 600 cell. It would be printed onto a thin, almost three-dimensional layer of a four-dimensional cardboard and the small four-dimensional hands would have no problem to fold and glue along the corresponding triangular faces together. In a second animation, all possible colors are used to highlight the intricate structure and a second version of the net of the 600 tetrahedra is shown as well. It is just a different representation for the same four-dimensional polytope. A second tool uses a projection that is first shown for the three-dimensional icosahedron. In front of one selected face, there is a focal point to which all other vertices of the icosahedron are pulled towards too. They are pulled until they reach the selected face and then they remain stick to this face. Again, the initially three-dimensional icosahedron has turned into a two-dimensional graph of vertices and edges. Only the color of the faces still resembles the information about the third dimension. The final state of such a projection is shown for the 600 cell. Don't forget that it is just a projection. All the vertices actually lie on a hypersphere in a four-dimensional space. This sphere is triangulated with 600 tetrahedra, whose triangles all meet with triangles of other tetrahedra. No single triangle will be unshared, and all 600 tetrahedra enclose a four-dimensional space inside. And don't forget where we started. At the beginning, we started with two quaternions and a few strange rules for multiplication. And at the end, there is a geometrical object that pushes our imagination to the limit and beyond. If you want to hear more crazy things like this, just stay tuned to this channel, leave your recommendations in the comments. That's all for now. Hope to see you again. Bye bye.